church. This is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, right? Uh, we are glad that you are here on this beautiful day. And uh, we want to get started, uh, continue in our study on uh, the book of Acts. And uh, we'd like to begin with our call to worship. It's in the bulletin there. This is from Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We'll have Pauline come up and get us going with some songs. Good morning. Please stand and join me with Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
all. Here's the announcement for this week. Can everybody hear me okay? No. no. Okay. Bibles. Remember, there are always Bibles in the pew for you to follow along in the message. Let's make it our goal for each one of us to have our own personal Bibles on hand. But if we don't, there's one in front of the pews. Just grab it and use it, and we're good to go. After service fellowship refreshments, remember, we need help in this area. It's beautiful to fellowship after, after service. Remember, the first uh, week of the month is a full meal, and the three Sundays that follow after that, we just have light refreshments. But we really do need help with sign up. So if you want to sign up or would like to sign up, there's a calendar located in the uh, hall. And also see June and let her know that we're going to sign up and we'll have this for next week. And we're always going to have something, but it's nice for everybody to pitch in. And please make it every effort that we can to go over and enjoy it together. And once again, it's a beautiful thing to fellowship together. High fives. Let's get into our high fives this year. Who did you call last week that wasn't here? Take a look around. Who will you call later to say we missed you? No, that's an awesome feeling when they call you and say I missed you. Volunteers, all our sound slides and sometimes videos need to be set up on Sunday between 10.30 and 11. Like I said last week, see Ryan if you wanna fill in for his position because sometimes he's not here. Like today, he's not here because he's not feeling good. So it'd be nice to have somebody back there. Thank you, Kelly, for filling in today. Beacon Light, remember Beacon Light is Wednesday and it's the third Wednesday, so that means it's this Wednesday coming up. Service starts at seven, be there at 645. Service lasts about an hour. If you need a ride or carpool, see Pastor, myself, June, one of the others, and we'll be glad to stay with us. That's all I have. Thank you, Victor. Yeah. If you reach into your bulletins, we'll grab our uh, praises and prayer card and uh, we'll do what we do here. We are going to write down our praises first, because that puts our mind in the right place with God. Amen? Amen? So let's take a moment and consider how has God blessed you in the past week, the month, or as you can begin the new year. And let's take some time and, and write those things down so that we can share that with one another. So let's take a moment and do that right now.
not already done so, let's uh, move on to our prayer request. Uh, I do have something special we'll do when we're done with this part, but right now let's consider ourselves. How uh, do you need your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray along with you? What do you need prayer for? Who do you need prayer for? We want to capture those things, share them together as we do in the bulletin. And uh, once again, I would encourage you each week when you get the bulletin to go through the bulletin and pray over those things. That's why they're there. So let's take some time right now and put down your prayer requests and let's do that together. As usual, we'll put those cards in the plate when it comes around. At this time, I'd like to do something uh, a little bit different. Uh, do you all know what the word amen means? The word amen means uh, may it be so. It's an affirmation. When you say amen at the end of a prayer, what you're saying is whatever you pray for, amen is may it be so. So I want to do a little something. Our, our dear friend Donis is uh, uh, in hospice care at the moment, and uh, we are uh, we want to lift her and her family up. So what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, say a short sentence, and I'd like to see each to raise her hand and say Amen. So you'll figure out when I pause, I'd like us all to just say Amen. Does that make sense? So let, let's try that now. I want to keep in mind those of you who know Donna's. All right, let's try that. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give comfort and peace to our dear sister Donna's. Amen. Father, we pray that you would make your presence known to her throughout this trial. Amen. Father, we pray for her family, for her daughter Kathy, who's taking care of her day by day by day, that you would give them strength and give them peace. Amen. And Lord, we pray that as the time comes, if and when it shall come in your good will, that you gather her to you, we pray that you would uh, welcome her into your loving arms, but not too soon, Lord. Amen. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, we all continue in our service with our Lord's Prayer. And uh, another way of reminding you at the end of this prayer, make sure that what you pray is what you really want to happen. When we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. Paul. 
clean. Please stand and sing Trust and Obey with me.
you will, to Acts uh, chapter 9, we continue with our story of uh, Saul. By the way, all morning I'm going to be saying Saul, then Paul, and Paul, then Saul. I get a little confused, but it's, a, it's the same guy. Um, you know, you got to appreciate a man on a mission, right? Uh, this past week, uh, if you're, I don't know if you're a basketball fan, but LeBron James has been pursuing and pursuing and pursuing the all-time scoring record for the NBA. And he made it. And uh, I, one of the things I thought was funny about that story is the, the night where he only had 36 points to make it, and he scores 36 points all the time, it cost you $45,000 to have a courtside seat. But that wasn't the funny part. People had paid $200,000 for a courtside seat the next night because they were betting he would make it the next night, but he made it the first night. Anyways, a man on a mission, and he, he, he achieved his goal. And uh, I, there's another sports thing going on later today. Some, something about football or something like that. So now you have uh, dozens and dozens of men on a mission. Um, that's really interesting, you know? Man on a mission. But I can't think of any mission more important, more exciting, more impactful, more meaningful than the Great Commission. If that was our mission, and we had the passion of LeBron James or those football guys, you know, what could we accomplish? You know, our story is about, we were talking about Saul, and last week we talked about how Saul uh, becomes converted. And you remember, he was a man on a mission. His first mission was to seek out and destroy all of those Christians. He had a license to kill. Even before James Bond, uh, Saul had a license to kill. And he was on the road and all that. He was a man on a mission. All of a sudden, Jesus pops up, and he switched his mission. But you know what's interesting about Saul? His passion, his drive didn't change in intensity, it just changed in purpose. So imagine all of the, the passion and energy that's going to be expended later on this afternoon about a sporting event. If that same energy and passion were focused on the Great Commission, what in the world could we accomplish? But I'll tell you something about people who are on a mission. There's a couple things you know about them. They can't wait to get to work. They're, they're, they got to get going. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They also know that the enemy is going to come for them once they get on this mission. So we're going to see how Paul deals with all this. But before we go to Scripture, let's pray. Father God, you, you give us these stories to teach us things. You give us these stories to give us examples you give us these records of the early disciples and the apostles to show us what can be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, as we delve into your word this morning, that you would visit us with your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds, that we might get the message that you have put down here for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul's just been converted, or Saul's just been converted to Paul. See, there I go. i got to get my salt <laughs> Better call Saul? That's really digressing. <laughs> so this, he can't wait to get going. Now how do we know that? Because when you go to the text, remember what's happened. He gets slammed on the road to Damascus. He gets thrown off his horse. He's blind. And he encounters the living Christ. And he goes up to Damascus where he was going to go persecute Christians. And for three days, he doesn't eat or drink. And he's blind. You know, it seems to me like if that got straightened out, I'd want to take a few days off. But that's not what Paul does. We, he's recovered his sight after meeting the Christ. So we begin with our, our first text is the beginning, the, the second half of 19. Let me just back up and read you the first part. And it, it says, uh, at taking food, he was strengthened. And now, for some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. He's recovering. 
And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not this the, is not this the man who made <coughs> havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? Man on a mission, three days blind, he takes a few days off, and the very first thing he does, and he goes out and proclaims that which he was trying to destroy. He doesn't wait. He can't wait. He's got to get out there. He's got to do it. Where's our passion like that today? One thing is certain, when you are on fire for God and you have a call on your life, you can't wait to get started. The prophet Jeremiah was getting plenty of pushback as he prophesied to the nation of Israel on behalf of God. He thought about quitting. If you go back and read the text, we're just going to read one verse. He thought about quitting, but he knew that wasn't going to work. And here's why. In Jeremiah 29, he says, If I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. So this is a guy who's being threatened. The Jews hate him. The kings hate him. But he's got this assignment from God to go out and, and, and stand up for God. In Jeremiah's case, he was calling out Israel for being, uh, well, let's just say less than what they should be. And the easy thing to do would be to do nothing. Way too many Christians today kind of think of this the same way. Christianity is under attack. People are not friendly to Christianity. The easy thing to do would be to sit at home, read our Bibles, pray, and once a week we sneak out of our house and come down to the church and sing. That would be the easy thing to do. But like Jeremiah says, you know, I, you know that's not enough. I, I've got this uh, burden on my heart. I've got to tell people about Jesus. People who are on a mission can't wait to get to work. Saul, at once he became part of the body of disciples in Damascus because he had accepted the Lord's commission. He didn't want to wait to start preaching Christ. He didn't go to the Gentiles immediately. At this point, he really hasn't focused on the Gentiles. He, he, instead, he goes to the, the Jews first. He went to the people of Israel. He went to the synagogue where he had intended to search out these Christians and lock them up. But Saul, he's completely filled with the Holy Spirit. He repeatedly proclaims Jesus as the Son of God. And the content of Saul's preaching in the Damascus synagogues was all focused on Jesus, that which he had been trying to destroy. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. This was exactly what he was railing against before. That Saul could preach such a message immediately after his conversion was possible only because of his experience on the Damascus road. Think back when you, for the very first time, had given your life to Christ, whatever that looked like. Well, the very first time you knew that Jesus was real and he loved you and he wanted to save you, that very first moment, can you remember a time when it was like, this is exciting? I remember when I finally got out of my own way and, and finally accepted Christ at the ripe old age of 45. I mean, I, I'm looking around everywhere. It's okay, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do, I, what do I study? What class do I take? I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I had to do something. And this is where Paul's at. He knows he's got to do something. Remember, he has an enormous body of knowledge about the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. He's a trained theologian. And he realizes that if Jesus is Messiah, and he knows all about Messiah from the scriptures, if Jesus is Messiah, i got to tell everybody about this. So he doesn't take a vacation. He doesn't uh, take a few days off. He, he doesn't wait. He doesn't go back to school. He gets out there right away, and he starts preaching Jesus as Messiah. 
Think the thing about it. He had a superpower. And I tell you this, based on scripture, <clears throat> we all have the same superpower. And that's the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that when you don't know what to say, ask the Holy Spirit and he'll give you what to say. It's like the greatest battery, uh, you know, Tesla power wall. Forget that nonsense. The Holy Spirit is there for you to plug into whenever you need to, to reinforce you, to get you moving, to help you have the courage and strength to do what it is that you need to do. And Paul was relying on this. This was no wild-mannered, weak-kneed preacher either. That fire in his bones had come out. Saul was more and more filled with the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. He later said in uh, Philippians, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's in Philippians 4. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now, Paul's not talking about, you know, uh, uh, making money. He's not talking about building a house. You know, he's in the, in, the, in the throes of doing ministry. So when he says, I can do everything through the Holy Spirit, what he's saying is I can do everything that God wants me to do if I call on the Holy Spirit. And so can we. When we get a little bit, uh, there's a saying that pastors use, uh, I'm spiritually dry. But you still love the Lord, you still like to read your Bible and all that, but that, that original fire is kind of tamped down. You need to go to the Holy Spirit. You need a refill. And it's there for you. And Paul's relying on that. Uh, by divine enablement, he baffled the Jews living in Damascus. I love that. He baffled the Jews. He confounded them. He threw them into amazement and confusion. Look at verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. And we can do that too. The, the factual stuff about the Bible and about Jesus and about the history and all that stuff is, is enormously more in depth than any other belief system on the planet. Then there is one group out there that claims that there was an, an entire Bronze Age civilization in North America. And it's, it's a big piece of their theology. Of course, there's absolutely no evidence that that ever existed. And when you think about their, their digging up things that they've never found before in Egypt that are tens of thousands of years old, to say that there was an entire Bronze Age civilization here, and that's part of what grounds our, our faith, and there's no evidence whatsoever, you know, it just calls into question. But if you go to Israel, the stories that we're telling you here, you can go there, you can walk there, you can, you can step in the waters that Jesus stepped into. You can stand on the heights at Megiddo and look out over where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. It's there. You can go to the place where John the Baptist baptized people in the Jordan. It's there. You can drive through Jericho. You can go throughout the old city in Jerusalem. It's, it's there. Now, we're not saying that you bring people to faith by proving anything. Now, he does use that here, but see, in the context here is what he's saying. He's going to the Jews who are steeped in the Old Testament, which is, is full of stories of the Messiah. When, what he's reflecting here is Paul, as a highly trained Pharisee, is going, okay, here's what the Old Testament said, that the Messiah will look like and how he will arrive, and look at what happened with Jesus. This is exactly what your scriptures say. He's not fooling around. He's not taking any prisoners. He showed them through the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Remember, the Christ means the anointed one. It's, it's another word for Messiah. But Jesus' last name is not Christ. As we saw, oh, it's Jesus Christ. No, it's Jesus who is the Christ. And this is what he showed them through their own scriptures. In other words, he used the Old Testament prophecies and he showed them how they were all fulfilled with Jesus. We know too that he never lost his love for his fellow Jews. However, the point to see is that Paul got right to work. So he, he couldn't wait and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing, folks. The enemy has his eye out 
for people like this. <clears throat> the enemy takes notice when we get fired up and we get about the business. And we, we shouldn't be surprised about that. The enemy takes notice because he's aware that, that when we are flowing in the Spirit's power, it's a challenge to what he's trying to do. Whenever the Spirit is active, the devil will also be active. And, and Paul certainly found this out to be true. He goes, and after this conversion and this mighty uh, teaching in Damascus, and he's confounding the synagogues, well, things sort of take a left turn. Look what happened next. When many days had passed, the Jews, <laughs> the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates night and day in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. So he, he knew that, or he was not surprised that the Jews turned on him. And we need to understand that when we get busy for the Lord, the enemy is going to take notice. See, here's the thing. If we're living the Christian life and we're loving the Lord and we have peace and everything's going wonderful and all that stuff. We have no challenges in our life. Uh, my proposition to you is you are no threat to the enemy. He doesn't have to worry about you. But when you get out there and you stick your neck out and you start talking about Jesus to people who don't want to hear it, the enemy is going to perk up. If you ever have the opportunity, there's a little book. It's called The Screwtape Letter, uh, written by C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest... Christian theologians of all time. And it's a great story, uh, which he got in a lot of trouble when he wrote it, but the basic premise is the whole book is one half of a conversation between a supervisor demon named Screwtape and his young apprentice demon named Wormwood. And Wormwood writes in and reports to Screwtape what he's up to, and Screwtape is coaching him on how to be a successful demon. But the things that he tells him about is, Wormwood will report that he, he got the guy a, a terrible illness. And Screwtape says, no, 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 no. That's the, see, that's not the kind of thing I want you to do. What I want you to do is get him a promotion at work. Because if he gets a promotion at work, he'll be distracted from the Bible. Wormwood comes in one time and he, he stirred up the sides to start a great world war. Screwtape comes back and says, no, 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 no. That's, that's not the way to go because when that kind of thing happens, that's where heroism comes from. What you need to do is, is have the person make money off of the war. So you, you get where this is going. What the enemy does is try to distract you, to turn you away, to get your focus on something other than your assignment, your mission. So when we look at our lives, you're if you really get on fire for the Lord and you really take up the mission that he's assigned to us all, you're going to run into opposition. And you need to be okay with that. Because if nothing else, it might tell you that uh, you're doing good for the Lord. Because if you're doing good for the Lord, the enemy <laughs> does not like that. But you got to be strong. How do you defend? We, if we had time, we'd delve into Ephesians where it says, put on the full armor of God. Paul in Ephesians tells you very specifically how to deal with the enemy. Putting on the full armor of God. It's a spiritual battle out there, folks. It's not a legislative battle, although that, there's elements of that. It's not a physical battle, although that sometimes happens. It, everything is a spiritual battle, and we have to be spiritual in our response to it. Paul understood because Jesus personally told him what it was he was supposed to do. And if Jesus himself comes to you and says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go door to door in your neighborhood and I want you to tell everybody about Jesus. Now, doesn't that sound scary? But if Jesus comes down and tells me to do that, I'm going to do that. No matter what I think will happen. And about every other door, somebody's going to bark at me or slam the door in my face. And that won't bother me. 
Hey, I worked for Sparkless Drinking Water for 13 years, and we had to get a new customer every single day. We had to go door to door and convince somebody to buy water from us, which of course they had running in the sink. I was very good at that. So, you know, you get used to getting rejection. A, a, a talented salesperson will hear no seven times before they get to the yes because they understand how it works. How about us, Christians? How many times are you willing to, to go to somebody and tell them about the Lord and have them say, ah, oh, that's a bunch of bunk. You guys believe in a bunch of... How many times are you willing to take that to get one person to say, I don't understand. Tell me a little more about that. There should be a number. If your mission, if you're a person on a mission, it should be as many as it takes. And that's how Paul lived out the rest of his life. He went and he went and he went and he went. And believe me, you want to talk about the enemy coming after you. If you know the story of Paul's life after this, pretty much everything happened to Paul. I mean, everything. And he just kept going and kept going and kept going. Wrote half of your New Testament. In spite of the enemy coming after him. So he couldn't wait to get going, but he relied on the Holy Spirit and he knew that the enemy was coming after him and it didn't slow him down, didn't stop, stop him at all. See, the enemy has a trick that he uses. And I always use this as an illustration. I think I have a funny picture up here. Uh, if you don't know who that is, it doesn't matter. But in the Warner Brothers cartoons, they used to do the same thing. Remember this in the old cartoons? You have the little devil on one shoulder and the little angel on the other shoulder. You know, this is funny, right? But this is what I'm talking about. This is how the enemy is going to come after you if you are on a mission. The devil is going to whisper in your ear and say, you don't have to do that. Or that person's not going to listen to you. Or, you know, this, this is, uh, you, you don't have to do this as long as you go to church and put your envelope in on Sunday. But the Holy Spirit is whispering in your other ear and saying what Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So the question for us is which voice, which voice are you going to listen to? The little devil voice or the voice of God? And then you just simply act accordingly. So here, let me kind of wrap this up. The question is, are you on fire for the Lord? Has the fire gone out? Are you chomping at the bit to get out there? If you are, you're listening to the Holy Spirit. If you are, the Holy Spirit is going to empower you to get the job done. As for the enemy, it's a good bet if you're getting resistance in your efforts. The enemy is taking notice of you. And they will try to stop you. Don't worry about that. Stonewall Jackson was a very dedicated Christian, Confederate general in the Civil War. Uh, he was doing uh, teaching English, uh, teaching reading to black slaves in Virginia prior to the Civil War, which was illegal in Virginia at the time. He uh, conducted church services himself out of the battlefield. But something about him really struck this. Historian Mark Brimsley wrote this, a battlefield is a deadly place even for generals, and it would be naive to suppose Jackson never felt the animal fear of all beings exposed to wounds and death. But invariably, he displayed extraordinary calm under fire, a calm too deep and masterful to be mere uh, pretense. His apparent obliviousness to danger attracted notice, and after the first Manassas battle, someone asked him how he managed it. And this is what he said. My religious beliefs teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God knows the time for my death. I do not concern myself about that. But to be always ready, no matter where it may overtake me. That is the way all men should live. And then all would be equally brave. How's that for confidence in the Lord? 
Saul went forth with this kind of confidence, and he helped change the world. Let us all go forth in confidence and try to change just our little piece of it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for being patient with us. Remind us always, Lord, that you are there for us through your spirit to guide us, to strengthen us, to help us be that which you would have us be. As we go forth today, let us be people on a mission, and that mission would be your um, great commission. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Pauline? Please stand and join me in our lesson. I surrender all. receive the benediction from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>